Hello, and welcome to another episode of Coach and Coffee. I'm back out at my beautiful view, this wonderful stone table right here. If you ever read the Narnia series, stone table might have a meaning to you, but anyway, this is a cool spot. Um, I just heard a dog barking over there, which is very odd because um, there's no one around here for a, a ways. So some dog will probably run up and find me randomly as always. Um, today we are going to talk about training for an ultra OCR. And by talk about it, I mean I'm going to give you my experience having done it and you can maybe learn or build off of what I'm saying. So make sure you get your coffee, come back, sit down, and let's talk about it. So uh, last year, 2019, I decided to do an ultra OCR. I figured I could do it <laughs> about halfway through the year after the Palmerton Super, uh, Palmerton, Pennsylvania. I'm, uh, a lot of people know that Spartan race. It's pretty well known for being miserable because it's on a very steep uh, ski slope and has a ton of elevation gain. It's just a brutal course and it's in Jul it was in July and so it's very hot as well. So it's just a challenging course overall. I had a lot of fun there. But after that race I decided I was going to do an ultra and so I looked on the uh, Spartan schedule to see what ultras were coming up and when and where. Where was kind of one of the more important factors just because I needed to be, uh, it needed to be close enough that I could get to it. Uh, so I saw there was one coming up in North Carolina. I think it was initially in, no, it was in Spartanburg initially, and then they moved the location for some reason. I guess it had flooded the year before at that location, something like that. Um, so uh, it was in November, and so it was. I was looking at this in July, and I was like, well, that'll work. I'll do it in November, and you know, North Carolina November shouldn't be too bad, shouldn't be too cold, shouldn't be too terrible, because um, I don't have a lot of gear for cold weight or cold racing, and uh, I didn't really want to spend invest a bunch of money in a cold for cold racing that I may not be doing a lot of. Anyway, so I started planning then. Uh, at the time, I was running uh, mid-30 miles a week, roughly, doing some speed work. Um, most of my training was distances like uh, 8 miles and under. Sometimes I'd branch out and hop up to like a half marathon like once a week or once every other week. Um, but most of it was like mid, what I would call mid distance, at least for me. If you're an ultra ultra runner, like 50 miles plus, that's not mid distance to you. But for me, that was roughly mid distance. And uh, a lot of my pacing would be um, like seven 30 minute miles for what I was doing. Uh, I wasn't using a heart rate monitor and everything. But for the ultra, I decided to start using a heart rate monitor, started um, using different zones for training and so I ended up uh, planning out the next however many weeks it was. I don't honestly remember now. I don't know, you know, we we'll just think July to n early November and that's how many weeks it was. Um, but I was gradually building my mileage up week by week, um, working a certain amount of mileage in at uh, lower zones, so about 80% of my work was in zone two and the remaining 20% was whatever I wanted. So some days I would just hit the trail and not even look at the heart rate monitor. I'd still wear it to get the data after the fact, but uh, I didn't want to I didn't want to see it. I just wanted to go and do perform how I wanted to perform and go as fast or as whatever as I wanted to. No no limits on those. So uh, it was hard at first to do eight, uh, zone two running for 80% of my work because my mileage was increasing. I built it up to just over 50 miles a week, I believe, by the time I was, um, by the time the race came around, about two weeks before the race came around, I was over 50 miles. And so it was harder for me to do zone two training just because for me that meant going slower than usual which meant doing more like 8 20 to 8 30 minute miles and um on trails that meant walking sometimes especially up some of the 
steep hills around here because I have some climbs around here that are over a thousand feet straight and uh, if you try and run up that your heart rates at least my heart rates in like 170 180 it gets up pretty high just depending on how hot it is and everything but still um, so I gradually built up my mileage it took more time to complete that mileage than it would have previously because I was in a lower zone, but I saw dramatic increases in my performance over that time. And I had known that that was something I wanted to work on eventually. I just hadn't gotten there before then. So that was a good motivator to do that at that time. Um, so as I was building my mileage, I was also focusing a lot on stretching and foam rolling. Very important to do, especially as you're increasing your mileage to make sure you're keeping your ranges of mobility, keeping proper uh, range of motion in your muscles and throughout uh, <clears throat> the stretch that a muscle can make as far as like how far it can actually stretch. You want that to be a good distance and you want to prevent injury. So stretching and foam rolling was very important. Um, Spreading the load was very important. So if I had to do 45 miles a week, I wasn't going to, you know, do 20 in the first four days and then in the last two days of training, drop the next 20. Unless, unless there was a specific reason to do so. But most of the time, it was as spread as it could be. And then um, every few weeks, I would throw in a longer duration thing. So. Sometimes that would mean a half marathon. Sometimes that would mean going up above 18 miles. And um, the longest run I actually did for that Spartan Ultra in training was 20, 25 miles. I had done a 50K, which ended up being a 35 mile trail race in February of 2019. Um, and that had like 4,500 feet of elevation gain. So that was um, much more challenging of a course as far as running goes than the Ultra, the Spartan Ultra was supposed to be. Um, obviously, obstacles are a difference, but. Um, and I'd run uh, like two marathons before or something just in training. But so I went out and did a six, almost six and a half hour, like 6.10 or 6.15 um, training event as my longest one. And it was 25 miles on trails around here. I got in as much elevation gain as I could in that run. So it was about 7,000 feet of elevation gain. Um, for the Spartan Ultra, I was expecting maybe 2,000. And uh, it turned out that was even a high estimate. I think it was just like over a thousand. Whenever Spartan at the start of a race tells you what the elevation gain is, just don't believe them at all. Because there were courses last year where they said there was a thousand feet and there was like 300. And, you know, that's a significant difference. Like 700 feet of discrepancy is very large. I don't know how they calculate it or what they used to track it. But after the race, everyone was like, no, it was nowhere near a thousand checking their devices. And I run elevation all the time. And I know <laughs> if something is getting up there in elevation or not. And anyway, so I think the course was just like maybe 1500. So my idea with doing that uh, 25 mile run with 7,000 feet was I'm vastly prepared vastly over prepared for the stress that I'm going to be put under during that race. I have no way to simulate um, without like setting up some extravagant thing and having to plan out a full day with someone else assisting me, which I don't really didn't have the option to do at the time. I have no way of simulating a 20 or a 31 mile obstacle course race. Um, so that was the next best thing. 25 miles on trails uh, on a relatively warm day. It wasn't hot, but it wasn't cool. Um, with 7,000 feet of elevation gain. And uh, that is a great build up to it. Um, the course ended up being miserable. The first half, I had to go way faster than I wanted to, which was something I didn't train specifically for because I didn't think I was going to be doing it. But the day of the race, uh, people took off and they took off much faster than I thought they were going to and they <clears throat> were holding the pace. And so I had to hold the pace to stay up front. 
I was racing in the uh, elite wave. And so first lap went well, feeling good. Second lap, lap it got much colder it started raining if you were at the mill spring ultra or any of the mill spring events last year um, especially on saturday sunday was cold as well uh, my brother luke raced that that morning but saturday was miserable people were dnfing like crazy the slopes were just mud slides at a certain point after the first lap first lap was great terrain was great because um, no one had cut up the course yet i was the like uh, fourth or fifth person running the course at that point uh, but second lap there had been hundreds of racers all over the course ripping it up as it rained and so I was freezing cold uh, I was shaky you know it was not a fun second half but I made it through I ended up placing third in the elite which was awesome uh, that was my first Spartan podium but it was far from easy And so with all that in mind, it was a gradual buildup. Uh, I think it was 17 weeks. And it's hard to stick to some, uh, with something for 17 weeks, but you just gotta do it. Um, so this is what we do with our uh, coaching stuff. Um, and so, you know, you build up the mileage week by week by week by week by week until you get to the point that you wanna be at. And then from there, you're ready to go. Uh, and so we have people who are, and so we have clients who were training for ultras who have been building up their mileage for months, truly months, and building up the elevation gain for months. And um, one of the cool things about that is seeing someone stick to a process and how, how much more confident they become because of it. So if you are, interested in running an ultra, I would highly recommend doing it, um, but only after you've trained consistently for it for uh, a relatively long period of time. There's a big difference between running an ultra and walking an ultra. Finishing either way is awesome. My goal is to run it, and to run it takes so much more training. Uh, you know, <clears throat> maybe anyone could go out and walk an ultra and make it in time. Maybe <laughs> a lot of people can't and don't because they end up DNFing at ultras because they don't make the time cutoffs. But it is possible to like hike one fast and complete it in time. Um, but if you want to run it, it's going to take a lot more training. And it, honestly, for a lot of people, it may take training to even hike it fast and make it. And I, I think the DNF rates kind of show that, unfortunately. No matter what, you have to plan for it. And if you haven't planned and trained, then you may end up DNFing, uh, especially if it's a harder course, um, one with a lot of elevation game. Killington's like the quintessential example of that where it's got so much elevation gain and it's such a, a hard course that people just DNF and fall out. But if you train, you can make it. So that was my experience training for um, a Spartan Ultra. Um, I was planning on doing three or four of them this year, including the Killington Ultra World Championship, what was supposed to be the Killington Ultra World Championship, uh, but didn't pan out because of the virus. It's all canceled and everything. But I was supposed to do New Jersey, uh, Vernon, New Jersey, Ohio potentially. I was thinking about doing one in June. I can't remember where that was. And then September with the Ultra. So I was planning on doing four. Um, and I was planning on doing very well with all of that. <laughs> but once the virus happened and things changed up, uh, I decided to change up my training routine and uh, scale back from Ultras and work on some uh, deficiencies that I had in like strength and things like that. And working on overall like movement patterns and strength through different movement patterns and cross training a lot more since I'm not doing an ultra this year. Um, there was no point in continuing to train for it when I had other things, other weaknesses I could fix and then be better next time around when I do an ultra the next time. Yeah. Seriously, this view is awesome. Sorry I've been looking out there and not at the camera as much. It's just this for you. Uh, that about covers it for today. 
If you're going to train distance, you need to build it up gradually over time. If you don't know how to do that, that is what we are here for. Reach out uh, info at triofitlife.com or head over to our website, triofitnessocr.com, and we will get you set up with a program. We have an ultra program specifically on our website that is seven days of training a week. One of those days we program in recovery and stretching and mobility work. Um, because we don't ever train anyone seven days a week. Most of the people we work with aren't at that level yet. <clears throat> um, and so that's a day off from training where they get to work on their mobility specifically. We program it in all week long as well, but that's a specific extra day of putting that in there to keep them healthy and strong. But otherwise it's six days of programming. So it's, it's a lot of work and the volume increases over time. Um, it just depends on where you're starting at, where you're trying to get to, but check those out. Um, and I will see you next time on Coach and Coffee.